parts of the wreckage have fallen on two residential areas. This house just seemed to be opened up like a doll's house. The fields and houses never and were all on fire. The whole place you couldn't have tell what was what. I stood there looking at the ceiling, thinking, it's going to come down on me, and this is where I die. Clearly, there has been a traumatic and uh, tragic happening of uh, a scale which I find it difficult to comprehend. There was a baby, uh, just a very young baby. It's, um, it just was lying there, and I, to be honest, I just thought it was a doll. You were either here and unscathed physically or you were gone. You know, people lost their lives, you know, people lost their loved ones, people lost so much. Um, I was there doing a job. I've put these gloves on, I said, all right, I'll go over and help, but... I just... happened. Pan Am Flight 103 powered down the runway at Heathrow Airport at 6.25 p.m. on Wednesday the 21st of December 1988. At that moment, the 259 passengers and crew on the flight to New York were doomed. Threads of chance are woven through the fabric of the tragedy. John Cummock was due home for Christmas. He thought he'd surprise his wife and young family by arriving early. On that night, his three children were aged just three, four and six. I was working as an interior designer and my husband John was in London on business. Uh, he was due to come home on December 22nd and the radio was playing. And on the radio was broadcasted that a, um, a passenger aircraft had left London and um, had disappeared off the radar uh, over Scotland. So I asked the workman to turn off the radio and, um, and stop for a minute. And I said, let's, let's have a moment of silence. I said, you know, we really need to, uh, to, to pray for these families. I said, you know, I'm sure that there's somebody waiting for all of them at the other end. And, um, you know, their lives will never be the same. Um, and, you know, I said, how sad right before Christmas or Hanukkah. And, you know, I said a, a little prayer out loud. And, um, you know, little, little did I know that I was actually praying for myself and for my family. Um, because later on that day, I found out that uh, John had changed his flight to try to get home a day earlier. Lockerbie is a, is a very typical Scottish rural town dreary weather, sleepy town type place ready for Christmas. It was a great feeling in Locker Bay because of Christmas time coming up and the children were going up and down the street delivering Christmas cards. We were sitting in the house watching, just watching the television. I think This Is Your Life was about to start. My father was away getting a turkey for Christmas. Well, I mean, I was a rookie at that stage. In normal circumstances, had that happened in daytime, I would never have been the person to be there. Pan Am Flight 103 was scheduled to leave London Heathrow at 6pm on the longest night in December 1988. The Boeing 747, named Clipper Made of the Seas, took off for New York JFK Airport at 6.25pm. 38 minutes into the flight, as the 259 souls on board, aged from just two months to 79, crossed the Scottish border, all contact was lost. If the flight had taken off on time and three decades on, that remains one of the many areas of dispute, the bomb would have exploded over the Atlantic. Lockerbie would have remained settled in the folding fields of southern Scotland. Instead, it is synonymous with the worst terrorist atrocity in the UK. Suddenly, without any warning, without any kind of indication, there was nothing that I could see from the sky at all. This huge explosion just erupted. Colin Dorrance was an 18-year-old probationary police officer. Lockerbie was his hometown. It was just a sea of fire. And 
even at that early stage, people were running towards what this explosion was to see what was going on. David Stewart was 17 at the time, on his family farm in the outskirts of Lockerbie. And we just heard this noise and I happened to look out the window um, and all I seen was a great big fireball, a great big cloud like a bush mushroom. The 3,000 residents of Lockerbie were met with scenes of death and destruction. Rosebank Crescent was hit by a 20-metre piece of rear fuselage. Less than half a mile away, the wings of the plane and more than 200,000 pounds of aviation fuel fell onto Sherwood Crescent. The resulting blast could be seen up to six miles away and measured 1.6 on the Richter scale. Canon Patrick Keegans, the parish priest, lived there at number one Sherwood Crescent. There was a violent explosion, a tremendous explosion. All the lights in the house went out. The house shook so badly that I wasn't even able to move. I was thinking of my mother downstairs and I stood there looking at the ceiling thinking, it's going to come down on me and this is where I die. As soon as I opened up the front door, everything in front of me in the garden, there was burning rubble. I don't know what it was, but I couldn't see anywhere beyond the house next to me because of the fire and the smoke. I didn't want to rush my mother or panic her any further. I put a scarf around her mouth and, and that and said, because of the smoke, and I said, well, hang on to me and don't look at anything. And I, went out of the house and there were helicopters above. It was some, like a scene out of Vietnam, Vietnam War. Helicopters, police, fire engines, ambulances, everything was there. And then it came over the television to say that there'd been a, about half past seven, to say that there'd been a, an aircraft had fallen. A Pan-American 747 jumbo jet with 258 people on board has crashed 15 miles north of the Scottish border. All I could see was this big ball of fire coming over here, you know. Huge ball of fire. I thought, oh my God, it's going to hit the house. I've seen a big streak of light, and then there's a big explosion. The sky just lit up in front of me, and just like a big mushroom. We thought it was a nuclear explosion. It was too, it was too frightening. Oh my God, it's terrible. And then sparks, and then the whole thing went down. We just could see houses on fire everywhere, like people just didn't know what to do. As I was walking up the street, the fires were breaking out in front of me, and behind me, and I was starting to, I was frightened. Complete shock and horror. Uh, the devastation at the first impression was, it was totally mind blowing. Do you know what it will like and do you like tomorrow? It was not the moment of death for everyone on the plane. Those not killed in the initial blast would have blacked out in the thin air. They would have regained consciousness as they plummeted to earth. They died when they fell onto Lockerbie, many of them here in the gardens at Rosebank Crescent. The sight in front of you just was a shock to everybody. I mean, there was, there was no getting away from that. At first glance, it seemed to be just wreckage and uh, you know, twisted parts of, of metal. There, there were Christmas presents in amongst this, which was quite surreal. And uh, from, you know, from certain angles, you could see uh, the, the landing gear, you could see the, 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 landing, the, the wheels of the, this, uh, this aircraft. Um, but in amongst it, in closer inspection, there were, there were quite a large number of passengers tangled in amongst this, this debris and uh, the, clearly the, there was no movement there, there was, there was no hope of, of anyone um, from that aircraft having survived it. The, the immediate concern was for the residents who had been um, potentially in this, especially the end house. Oh everything was just as it is just now, everything blown up. In fact I thought it was electricity cables but wasn't it that at all, being a plane. The horror of the scene was beyond anything anyone could have experienced outside of war. This is the first time I've ever spoke about it. I hadn't even discussed it with my wife. David Stewart went out with his father to search their farm in the forlorn hope of finding survivors. The reality was very different. I think I was standing on the back of the, the pickup, just with the torch, just shining to see what we could see. Um, 
and there was a and there was, was continued we found another uh, there was a baby uh, just a very young baby and same just was lying there and I, to be honest I just thought it was a doll it was just so so small and perfect and just never really realised what it was this little girl with a, just this blonde blonde hair uh, I just remember picking her up because she was two years old or something the child was 18-month-old Bryony Owen, who'd been travelling with her mother. She was one of 20 children killed. David's father took on the task of taking the bodies to the designated mortuary at the town hall. With his truck laden with aircraft debris, the only place for the dead child was beside him in the passenger seat. The young policeman on the door was Colin. In the corner of my eye, I could see that there was there was someone in the passenger seat, uh, wrapped in, uh, I think it was a duffel coat or something like that. And said, "What what do I do? I've I've, I've got this uh, child." So um, this child uh, looked like they were asleep, and uh, it, it was just a moment that you had to stop and, and take stock a second. And uh, we could see, you know, clearly this was just a young child. It was just one of those moments. It was it was it was shocking. Other other colleagues talk about that that you know child too in the in the uh, the hall. We have uh, spent the last few hours visiting some of the sites of the disaster, and it is one of those nights one will never forget. It's clearly been an appalling disaster and all our hearts and our thoughts go out to the large number of people who will undoubtedly have died as a result of this accident. While many of the bodies from the plane were scattered in a grotesque tableau around the town and the fields, houses on the quiet street of Sherwood Crescent were obliterated. Little trace remained of the people who had lived there. There's an area of the town at Sherwood where there was severe damage to houses and uh, I am fearful at this stage about the casualties at that location. Teams of emergency workers are sifting through the smoking rubble. Their expressions are of disbelief, reflecting the feelings of everyone in this border's town. Every kind of emergency vehicle is here in the centre of Lockerbie. I just didn't have the experience to think, right, how am I going to deal with this or devise... Kay Adams, now a household name, was at the start of her career as an STV news reporter. Nothing could have prepared her for what she confronted. We saw the flames from the crater. Um, and then that, I guess, was when it really did hit home that this was, you know, just a huge disaster. I remember very clearly there was three or four inches of debris on the road, you know, just, just, just charred embers of, of stuff. Um, I remember having on high heels and trying to pick my way through, not very smart, um, this debris continuing to the crater which just became bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. That was the first really standout image that was, you know, without being too melodramatic, was like the gates of hell. I tried to get up as far as I could into the flames and smoke. I think basically to say, at least I tried. I tried to get through to help my friends. I knew what I was doing was really symbolic. I knew everyone in the street, but within my head I knew anyone who was involved in that area where the impact was, was dead. I'm not in a position to see how it happened. As reports of the atrocity spread, the world began to hear the name Lockerbie. And now we go live on the KSRO Live line. We have Mr. John Mackay to get the latest on that downed New York bound jumbo jet. A number of houses have been destroyed. There are burned out cars on the roads. Relatives of those who died on the plane and the people of Lockerbie are left to pick up the pieces. Wessex helicopters were out there with huge you know, spotlights um, circling the town um, and there was paper fluttering about um, in, the, in the air uh, being caught by these lights and so on. And it's at that point you think 
this town will never be the same. It, it's, it's just been, you know, host to a huge air crash and um, it, it will get known, you know, for, for this. And that, that, that was dawning. Victoria's husband, John, was not supposed to be on the flight. As news filtered through to the States, her world was torn apart. At about 3.34 a.m., all of a sudden, I looked outside the house and there were all these media trucks and everything there. And, you know, there was no reason why any media person would ever come to my house my whole life. So, you know, obviously they knew something. And so uh, I was on the phone with somebody from Pan Am and I said that all these media trucks had pulled up and I said, and they, there's so many of them, I'm really concerned that they're going to wake up my children. And I said, uh, my kids are going to take one look at me and see that I'm very upset. And I'm not going to lie to them, but I don't know really what to tell them. And, you know, you have to have the decency of, you know, telling me, um, was John on the flight? And they said, uh, yes, he was. The shift force of four police officers in Lockerbie was rapidly reinforced by hundreds from elsewhere, along with emergency personnel and soldiers. Hospitals were on standby to receive survivors. There have been no survivors reported from the crashed aircraft, and we're waiting for Dr. Hill, who's the on-site medical officer, to give us a, an official stand down. Ambulances were parked nose to tail as far as you could see along the street, um, from as far south as South Yorkshire, as far north as Aberdeenshire. They, they, they'd all descended on the town with a, you know, um, optimistic view that they might be able to help. And as it was, there were very few people injured um, seriously. So it was quite poignant. You were either uh, here and unscathed physically or you were gone. And as we drove past Tundergarth, you could see sort of these hazy shapes, um, which initially looked like sheep. And that's initially what I thought that it was. And then it became clear that actually these were passengers who had fallen from the sky. It was quite difficult to comprehend. The aircraft investigators were trying to um, reconfigure the plane and then they had plastic bags all full of the kind of usual stuff that you take on flights. So there was children's books, there was shoes, there was cassettes, um, you know, sweeties. And I think for me that was probably a much more kind of sobering moment because you could absolutely make the connection with sitting on an airplane, you know, just sitting on an airplane, watching the movie, cup of coffee, sweeties, and boom. I found out that he was sitting in, in seat 3A, and that, um, uh, which meant that he was in the nose cone of the flight. And the iconic photograph that appeared in all the newspapers showed an attache case in the forefront of, of the nose cone of the plane. And it was John's attache case. It was. Uh, one that I had just given to him for our wedding anniversary in August. So that, to me, confirmed that, yes, he really was there. The nose cone of Flight 103 lay in a field at Tundergarth Hill, its name, Made of the Seas, scripted on its side. It became the iconic image of the bombing. The wreckage was spread over many miles, but the job of collecting it and sifting through it had already begun. It has been established that two parts of the metal luggage pallet framework show conclusive evidence of a detonating high explosive. It quickly became clear that this was no tragic accident. This had been a deliberate act of terror, with 270 victims, the worst terrorist atrocity in UK history. 
oh, it's horrific. Bad enough that a plane crashed and, you know, and that had taken John's life. Um, but then to find out that it, you know, it was an intentional act. Terrorism at that time was something that happened to somebody else somewhere else. In the immediate aftermath, the investigation rapidly became international in scale. In Lockerbie, they began to mourn the 11 of their own who had died. One thing I felt strongly was, I felt that the children should have lived and I should have died. When I came to Joanne's funeral, the young girl who was only 10 and, and the others who had died, I felt I wish I'd gone rather than them. Three years later, two Libyan agents were charged with the bombing and one, Abdul Basit al-Magrahi, was convicted and given a life sentence. Many continued to challenge that verdict. He served his sentence in Scotland before being controversially released by the Scottish government on compassionate grounds, suffering from terminal cancer. He died in 2012. 30 years on, the man accused of the bombing is dead. Pan Am, once the biggest international carrier in the United States, has collapsed and the ruined houses of Lockerbie have been rebuilt. But for those impacted by the devastation of that night, it will never be erased. It wasn't really until I got John home and I saw him that I was able to shed a tear. You know, I was 35 years old. Uh, I, you know, none of this was anything that I could have ever imagined would have happened um, to, to me and John and our family. It took, I would say, decades for it to really come to terms and um, put what happened um, in, a, in a particular place and, and try and deal with it more sort of coherently, I suppose. The most remarkable thing right away was the response of the people of Lockerbie. So their one main concern was to help people and they were consistent with that and persevered with that right up until this day. Thousands of people volunteered their time. People like David continue to this day to open their doors to visitors. And I think, above all, relatives and, and those who lost really appreciate that. And, and they're looking for the positive to come you know, from us too. I love Lockerbie and, and I love Scotland. Um, Lockerbie and the people there have, have been so loving, so helpful, so supportive. John Cummock is buried in Tundergarth Cemetery, only yards from where his body fell onto Lockerbie. I went up to Tundergarth to see where the nose cone fell and, and I saw a beautiful Tundergarth church. That was the Scotland that John loved. And I thought, oh no, this, this is, I knew immediately um, that that's where, he, that's where he belonged. 